Mike sat on the bleachers of a large gymnasium and watched with admiration his 17-year-old daughter, Darla, who at that moment showed wonders of flexibility and artistry on a makeshift arena made of mats. The girl lightly made a long silk ribbon obediently curl around her slender legs and then made a sharp turn, threw the handle from the ribbon in the air and deftly catch it when her body gracefully rotated around its own axis. The hall was immediately deafened by applause and a happy smile broke out on Darla's face. Waving goodbye to the audience, the young girl left the mat and her performance ended. Dad, what do you think? Darla asked her father with excitement in her voice as she tightened the laces of her light-colored sneakers. What can I say? You're a professional, honey. A real fairy on stage, Mike said smiling. If I hadn't seen you plow ten hours in the gym, I would never have thought that all those fluttering with ribbons. It's such a hell of a lot of hard work. Oh, come on. The girl shrugged. Standard workouts. I don't have anything special. The Olympic champions are the ones who work with such dedication that I never dreamed of in my worst nightmares. Can you imagine that they sometimes sleep only 4-0 a day and then go straight to training? And this is a flutter compared to them. So, a mere amateur, Darla shook her head, and her father gently stroked his daughter's arm instead of saying anything else. He knew very well how important rhythmic gymnastics was to him and how much time and effort his girl devoted to this beautiful but incredibly hard activity. You're always downplaying your efforts and your talent, Mike said softly. You remind me a lot of my mom. She, too, doubted herself every time it came to putting her paintings up for sale in galleries. Always afraid of large-scale exhibitions, Carla looked at him with slight sadness. If you only knew how much I miss her, Dad. She said wistfully, adjusting the antique silver bracelet on her arm, the only memory of her mother Alina that she had left after her death. Her father had once given his fiance this lovely bauble as a token of his love, and she had never taken it off since. When her daughter turned 12, Mike gave her the bracelet. Alana and the girl, just like her mom, wore it on her right hand all the time. Honey, you perform just fine. Mommy would be proud of you. Believe me, her father assured her. After all, it's still just a preliminary screening. You have plenty of time to hone the elements you're not completely sure of. Darla looked at her father with genuine gratitude and love. You know, I'm incredibly lucky to have a father. You're the best daddy ever. The girl put her arms around her father's neck and lightly pecked his cheek. Are you going to go to work again now? Yeah. Mike stretched out with a sigh. What do I do if my managers can't close a single deal without me? Father and daughter look at each other understandingly and then laugh amicably. Both of them knew perfectly well that no managers had anything to do with it. It was just that Mike being a successful businessman, liked to plan everything on his own and make deals. That's why he often stayed in his office until the middle of the night or traveled for weeks at a time. The businessman did not trust his business to anyone, even his most trusted people, and preferred to keep control over everything that happened inside his company. The same kind of humor helped him further diffuse the situation at times when his daughter would have loved to spend a couple more hours with her father. Darla realized, however, that this was sadly not possible. Okay, thank you for coming to the checkup today, she said to Mike. It meant a lot to me, really. Daughter, remember one thing. You will always be my priority, no matter what happens, always. The businessman repeated again. After that, the two of them got into his luxury car and drove to Mike's country mansion. After dropping Darla home and saying goodbye to her, the businessman went straight to his office. He had an important case scheduled for today, and he really hoped that luck would favor him this time the partners from France, with whom the businessman had long dreamed of concluding a contract, finally paid attention to the success of his firm. Now Mike very much expected to conclude with them a very favorable deal for himself while he and the driver were driving. The man involuntarily plunged into his own memories. Few people, looking at this another man of 45 years old, would think that he was born and raised in the most ordinary family. However, that is exactly what happened. Mike's parents worked at the same factory, his father as a welder in the hot shop, and his mother as a cook in the factory cafeteria. It was not easy for young Mike to work his way up through his own social environment. The guy dreamed of big money and serious business practically from childhood. He did not fit in with the ideals of the so-called working youth of those years. Someone considered him an upstart, and someone directly called him a loser and warned that the desire for more will only come to him in a bad way and Mike shouldn't get involved with anything more complicated than construction tools or blueprints and a dial. 
However, young Mike did not consider it shameful to be an upstart among his peers and went steadily towards his goal of stratification of business. At home, Mike was not very supportive either, but his father, unlike his mother, who was terribly worried about the future of her not moderately ambitious son, at least believed that the boy can still do something. You shouldn't be so worried about him, Catherine, said John, Mike's father. He's a smart kid who studies all day long. He'll be a good kid in the big city. So now he has to spend the rest of his life at the factory with us, mowing his health for nothing. Catherine only shook her head and wept. John, dear, look at him. What kind of businessman is our son? It is so not serious. He's so puny, so weak. He even got a certificate of exemption for physical education. They'll torture him there, and that's all. Still, Mike was absolutely sure that what he had planned would work out, and therefore he was intensively preparing to enter the Faculty of Economics all summer after graduation. The hard work and desire of the guy was eventually rewarded. Having entered the budgetary place in the university, Mike immediately moved to New York, where he was even allocated a room in the student dormitory. The mother of the guy to the last did not believe that her poor boy leaves to conquer the big city. However, her spouse explained to her that such a smart and talented guy, as their son was, just did not understand. Catherine John tried to reason with her. He has absolutely no future here, unlike in the big city, where he can put all his calculating skills into practice. Catherine still cried as she did so, but eventually resigned herself to it. She sincerely wanted her son to succeed, and he would find his happiness in a noisy and bright metropolis. Over the next five years, Mike pleased his parents and his teachers with success in his studies. The guy was considered one of the best students in his course at the university, passing each session only for excellent grades. Mike's father was very proud, and his mother began to realize that her husband was right. They were already making grandiose plans for their son's future when a terrible tragedy happened in their lives. Both spouses died in a terrible fire that occurred on their property. The fault of drunken neighbors, they had a party in their house and did not watch the stove. And at night, the fire broke out with terrible force and immediately spread to the roof of John's bathhouse, which stood right next to the neighbor's house, separated from it only by an old fence. When Mike's father woke up and rushed to put out the fire, it was too late. The bathhouse was almost burned to the ground, and the flames were starting to reach Catherine and John's house, trying to knock down the fire. The couple used up all the water that was on their property and wanted to give up this thankless task, especially since the fire department was in no hurry to come to their remote village. The husband and wife tried to take out of the fire all the most valuable money and documents for the house accumulated over many years of hard work. At that moment, a heavy floor beam collapsed on them with a terrible rumble. The police, who then arrived at the scene of the tragedy together with specialists, stated that it was an accident. Mike's parents died almost instantly and there was no one to blame for their deaths. Mike, who was then in his final year of university, learned about the death of his parents and went into severe shock. He could not eat for several days and during the funeral and the wake that followed, he could not utter a single word. Grief tearing at his broken heart. And the young man wanted nothing and expected nothing more from his life. The death of his nearest and dearest people seemed to finally undermine him, destroying all the joy and purposefulness on which he only lived all the last years. A week after all that happened, Mike discovered the first gray hair on his temples. At that moment, he finally realized that his youth had come to an end and that now he was an adult. After returning to the city, the first thing the young man did was to sell his parents' property. He did not want to return to the village ever again. Too many difficult events had happened there, and Mike wanted to close the door to that part of his past forever. To settle the land, the future businessman delved back into his studies, trying to ignore the pity in the eyes of his classmates. Now, the main goal of the young man was to finish the university with a red diploma. So he wanted to honor the memory of his mother and father and prove to himself that he could still achieve his goal. Otherwise, all this and study and his move to the big city was for nothing. The only person who supported him all this time was his girlfriend, Alana. She studied at the same course as Mike, only she chose the Faculty of Art History. The young student was crazy about painting and architecture and even drew very well herself, but she never believed in her own strength enough to switch from the study of art to its direct creation. Alana admired the endurance and perseverance of Mike, so when he almost broke the story of the death of his relatives, the girl did everything possible so that her beloved did not feel lonely. It was then that Mike himself first thought about how strong his feelings for Alana. 
Realizing that only she alone was for him all this terrible time support and support, Mike decided and made his beloved a proposal. Will you marry me? Mm, Mike asked in the courtyard of the Philharmonic after they left the concert early. They both found the concert terribly boring. To make his words sound more solemn, the guy got down on one knee in front of his beloved and handed her a small open heart-shaped box covered with red velvet. Inside it on a snow-white silk pad lay a gold engagement ring with a tiny, but sparkling like a star diamond. Oh my God. Mike, she gasped delightedly. How lovely. Mike looked at her expectantly and with some tension in his gaze. Elena forgot herself for a moment, slightly bewildered by the unexpectedness of the situation, but then exclaimed happily, yes. Well, of course, I agree. My love, the lad, was greatly relieved. Just in a burst of feelings, she spun in a light dance, after which he tenderly kissed his bride. After the wedding, life flashed new colors for Mike. The first thing he had to do was to find a job that would allow them to rent a good apartment and continue the cultural lifestyle to which they had become so accustomed during their time as students. So, having collected his documents and diplomas, the guy went to interview in all decent firms, where they were ready to consider his candidacy for a place as an economist or financial analyst. After the third interview, he was accepted in a promising young firm, which was engaged in the supply of building materials throughout the country. And it was in this company that the man subsequently worked until the very moment he was asked to head it. Alana also did not intend to sit on her young husband's neck and therefore quite quickly found a place as a staff guide in one of the capital's museums. Yes, it was not as prestigious as the work of a real art historian, but it was certainly better than running on all fumes waitress in some cheap eatery while your diploma is dusty on the shelf and does not bring any benefit to society. Young people worked hard and then could disappear all day long somewhere in the theater or at fashion exhibitions. For some time, the couple lived, as they call it, for themselves enjoying feelings in each other's company. This was not very much like the parents of Alana herself, who constantly pressured their daughter with requests to give birth to their grandchildren. However, the girl was resolute in her intention to get on her feet first, and then already engaged in expanding her own family. I don't like these progressive views of yours, daughter. Every time Elena's mother came to visit her daughter and son-in-law, we're doing quite a lot of things with our father, aren't we? When do you want us to take care of your little ones? Mama, you don't have to get along with anyone, she smiled. Not now, not later. Mike and I are grown, independent adults and are quite capable of raising our children on our own. If we need your help, it will certainly be rare. Don't worry. Alana's mother pressed her lips together and looked at her daughter sadly. No way had she thought she would be faced with her own daughter's reluctance to have children in her old age. If they were adults, they would have babysat long ago. Or instead of going on and on about culture, how much more can we do? Ashley, though a native city dweller, was a member of the so-called old school crowd. She didn't understand why her daughter and her husband didn't live like the normal daughters of her friends. Why don't they give birth to fat, flexible babies whose laughter would drown out the expanse of their large one-bedroom apartment from morning to night? You seem to have completely forgotten what a woman's true mission is, don't you? Her mother asked Alana, looking at her reproachfully. Mom, don't start, please, Alana begged her so I'll remind you. I don't mind, Ashley continued as if not noticing her objection. A woman's mission is to give birth and nurture and pass on all her experience and love to the next generation. Alana clutched her ears with her hands each time to keep from hearing the same thing. Alana's mother had worked as a middle school teacher all her life and had given birth to Alana herself very late by the standards of her friends when she was already over 30. However, as soon as she started such a conversation with her daughter, it would immediately appear that she had good reasons for it, which you see Alana herself lacked. Um, I promise you, when we decide to have a baby, you and dad will be the first to know, Ashley replied tiredly. Her daughter was unable to go against her stubbornness. But how long do I have to wait for you? The woman said, and then abruptly turned the conversation to some other topic. Mike and Elena spent several more years childless before they felt ready to have a son or daughter, and I was 28 years old at the time. But despite some concerns from doctors about her age, the woman was successful with their future daughter for most of her term. Of course, at first she, just like all pregnant women, was tormented by a little toxicosis and swelling in the first trimester. But all this passed quite quickly, and then Alana felt just fine. By that time, Mike had become a successful top manager in his firm, and the general director warned him that he saw him as his future successor. 
He said that only such a person as Mike would be able to provide his company with a decent development after he went on a well-deserved vacation. Mike then took the words of his boss with all responsibility and was ready to work two or three times as much if the company's business required it. At the same time, he was not going to miss the birth of his wife, about which he warned the management. The director reacted surprisingly calmly, to such an extent he trusted his best employee. So he gave Mike something like a mini maternity leave during the Lena was already choosing a name for the baby when the news of Ashley's death suddenly broke. Mike received a call that day from Alana's father who told him that his wife had had a heart attack during the night. Mike was devastated by the news and for a while didn't know the best way to tell Alana. He was very worried that such a shock could adversely affect the condition of the child. So at first, he even thought not to tell his wife anything before the birth so that she did not worry. However, nothing came out of this idea, as Elena very quickly realized from his face that something, you're hiding something from me, I can see it, she said to Micah as she lay in the labor room, stroking her large rounded belly, realize by not telling me anything, you're only making it worse. Her husband looked at his beloved wife, and in his eyes, Alana saw regret and pain. What's wrong? The pregnant woman asked him again, more insistently, for something with my parents. Don't be silent, tell me. Mike sucked in more air into his chest before slowly speaking. Dear Alana, you just don't worry. Your mom? What? What is it? She said, pale, even though she had already realized that she was in trouble. She's no longer with us, Mike said quietly, lowering his head. For the next few moments, Alana sat silent and unmoving. The man began to worry if she had gone into shock when her spouse suddenly exclaimed several times and with the words, Mommy, Mommy, honey, why did you leave? She burst into tears at the top of her voice. Mike tried to calm her down as best he could, but quickly noticed that his wife's sobs had at some point turned into painful screams. So he called for a nurse, and the nurse, after a cursory examination of Alana and probing her abdomen, stated that she was in labor. Oh God, it hurts. Alana cried out once again as she was wheeled on a gurney to the delivery room. Mike had been there the whole time saying something encouraging to his wife. Though now, after so many years, he couldn't remember exactly what it was. He wasn't allowed to go to the operation. So Mike was forced to spend the next few hours in the corridor, sitting on a hard, uncomfortable chair and listening to the incessant cries of his wife from behind the door. The businessman remembered that at some point his nerves got the best of him and he simply passed out. He came to his senses only after the doctor who delivered Alana shook him violently by the shoulder. Mike, you're not feeling well, wake up, please. The man struggled but regained consciousness and began rubbing his face with his palms to quickly regain wakefulness. When he looked up at the doctor, he immediately realized something was wrong. His face was as white as chalk. The hand that had just awakened him was cold as ice and somehow lifeless. How is my wife? How is Alana? Is she feeling well? The first thing the businessman asked the doctor and nurse quickly glanced at each other. The doctor then informed Mike, I'm sorry, Mike, we did everything we could for your spouse, but the bleeding was too much. Plus, the baby girl was very large. In coming out, she hit a vital artery in Alana's body. She didn't stand a chance. Again, my condolence. Mike felt his chin shake finally with horror then. Salty tears sprang from his eyes of their own accord. No, he whispered and shook his head negatively. No, it can't be. She couldn't die, she couldn't. He said, take Mike to the spare room and sedate him. The doctor commanded the nurse. We don't want him throwing a tantrum in here. The man himself did not remember how he had found himself in the ward, lying on the hard bed and staring at the ceiling at a single point next to the old chandelier. It was only now beginning to dawn on him that he had lost her, lost his Alana, the only woman he felt truly alive and happy with. They'd been married for almost eight years. Eight. He couldn't even believe it then. It seemed to him that they hadn't been married more than a week or two, and now she was gone. God, he roared like a wounded animal. For what? All that was left in his chest. All remnants of his soul seemed to have been scorched to the ground. The pain of loss was so intense that he felt it physically, right where his tortured heart was located. It wasn't until later that he remembered that he had a child. A girl, my daughter? What's wrong with her? Mike asked, silence surrounding him. Jumping out of bed, the man rushed to the doctor's office and asked the surgeon, who delivered his wife, the same question. Calm down, please sit down. The doctor pointed him to a chair. When Mike reluctantly complied, the woman continued. Your daughter is fine. She's in a postpartum pod right now. That's perfectly normal for her situation. The businessman looked at her as if his future depended on her words. 
considering her mother is dead. Subsequent nutrition for the baby will have to be done solely by artificial feeding, so I suggest you look into the matter as soon as possible. The doctor looked at Mike a little sternly, but when she saw that he was genuinely worried about the fate of his child and at the same time experiencing the tragic death of his wife, she softened considerably. Look, I understand what you're going through, honestly, but you are not the first and, unfortunately, not the last man whose wife dies during childbirth. It happens, and there's nothing you can do about it. The doctor leaned closer to the businessman and continued. The only thing you need to think about right now, the only thing you need to focus on as much as possible, is your little girl in the newborn box. So be a role model for her. Be strong, confident in your own success. Believe me, children read all this no worse than adults. In addition, it will help you get closer, which for a child who lost his mother in the first few hours of life is incredibly important. Mike nodded slowly then and swallowed with difficulty the huge acidic lump in his throat. If all of what the doctor was saying was true, then he would be the best father in the world to his daughter. When he was allowed to pick up his daughter, Mike almost cried when he saw the tiny baby girl in the pink warm envelope. That same day, he gave the girl the name Darla, which in translation from Greek means winner. For the next 17 years, the businessman did everything possible for his daughter so that she never for a minute did not stop feeling his love and support. Although at first it was very difficult for the single father, but he still managed to survive this difficult period. Despite being constantly busy, Mike still tried to be there for his child whenever possible. Darla never spent a single birthday or New Year's Eve alone or surrounded by only babysitters and daycare children. So when a daughter at the age of four became seriously interested in rhythmic gymnastics, the father only marveled at the willpower and stamina of his nondescript Darla. The girl's grandfather, John, in the early years of great help to his son-in-law, took the little girl to the section and later into competitions. Darla adored her grandfather and considered him her second best friend on earth after her father. Unfortunately, John was already quite old at that time and, like his late wife, had heart problems. When the granddaughter turned nine years old, her grandfather passed away was the cause of the man's death was a massive stroke, which immediately gave a fatal complication to his heart. Darla cried very long and hard at the time. She could not imagine life without her beloved grandfather. So Mike was forced to take an unscheduled vacation at his firm for an indefinite period of time. For the next two weeks, he never left his daughter's side, constantly improving and distracting her until the little child's grief gradually subsided. In time, Darla returned to her usual routine and constant training, and this was the salvation that helped her to finally calm down and become stronger and more solid in spirit. I will dedicate every victory I win to my grandfather, Darla promised her father. I believe both he and mom and grandma are all watching over me from heaven and would really like to see me succeed in sports. Of course, dear, the businessman smiled fondly, broking his daughter through her soft, light brown hair. You know, you're an incredibly wise girl. I'm really glad you were able to let go of grandpa and continue to enjoy life. I love you, daddy. Shortly, Darla answered him and hugged her father tightly around the neck. Mike, are you okay? Can you hear me? Announced the businessman and his driver when they were already approaching the office, thus bringing the man out of his reverie. Why? Yes, of course, Nicholas. You were saying something I couldn't get back to reality right away. Nicholas's driver looked at him carefully in the rearview mirror but said nothing. He had often noticed how his boss was immersed in his thoughts while on the road and so he was used to it by now. Yes, I'm telling you. Human Resources just called and said they were able to find you a new receptionist, Nicholas said, and at the same time carefully parked the owner's car. They want you to take a look at her. They say she's a very competent lady. She knows what she's doing. She even seemed to have worked for your competitors some time ago, but left them because she wasn't satisfied with her salary. Oh yeah, Mike chuckled. All right, well, let's see who this lady is. I hope she at least knows how to make good coffee. A quarter of an hour later, he was already receiving in his office a tall, long-legged beauty of about 30 years old, giving him her graceful thin hand. As a sign of welcome, the woman introduced herself as Vivi and told the businessman about her extensive experience in secretarial work. Lexen, who the company director noted to himself with satisfaction that the recruiters had not lied to him. This sultry brunette with plump lips and a thin waist really held her dignity and could present herself as if she were a real professional and her gorgeous appearance was just the cherry on the cake, fitting the requirements of a reputable company like they were. 
I think we're working with you, Vivi. Congratulations. You've been hired by us. Of course, you will have to go through a probationary period first, but I don't think you should have a problem with that. Vivi gave him a charming, special smile, then flicked a strand of her dark, bitter, coffee-colored hair over her shoulder in elegant motion. Thank you, Mike. I'm sure I'll enjoy working for your company, too. I can just feel the positive energy hanging around here. The woman lifted herself easily from the chair, and at that moment, the businessman saw a small, but rather racy part of her tanned cleavage. Vivi smiled again, while Mike involuntarily threw himself into a fever, and for a few moments, he even found it difficult to breathe. Since the death of his beloved wife, Alana, the businessman never remarried. Moreover, he hadn't been able to find a worthy companion with whom he could spend his time carefree and who could open his soul as easily as he had with his wife. Oh, and he was just as worried about Darla. How would the girl feel about having another woman in his life? Would she get along with a hypothetical stepmother? Or would the relationship between them be in constant tension? All these fears tormented Mike and did not give him the opportunity to really relax in the company of a nice woman. Later, he gave up these thoughts, referring to his age and constant business busyness. It's Mole, who will marry me so busy. And here before him stood this stunning Vivi, whose smile could drive any sensible man crazy at the snap of a finger. The businessman's heart beat faster as he imagined that he could marry such a beautiful person. However, Mike hurriedly put such thoughts out of his mind. He did not want to become a bad illustration of the famous joke about the boss and his faithful secretary mistress. Gathering all his self-control in a fist, Mike politely said goodbye to the young woman, and she sent him a promising smile in return, then quietly replied, I'll look forward to my first day on the job. Good day, Mike, she said, and as gracefully as she had entered, she slipped through the open door of his office. The businessman leaned back in his chair with relief and took a few deep breaths and exhaled. Such a turnaround he certainly hadn't expected even from himself. Could it be that for the first time in all these years a real hot feeling flared up in his soul, that this was the very fall of love, which so many famous poets had sung in their verses so many times? Be that as it may, we must first take a closer look at this Vivi. Mike thought to himself, it's not worth it at my age to jump into the deep end. We should wait a while. Having decided everything for himself, the man returned to work with difficulty and spent the rest of the day filling out another final report. However, no matter how hard he tried, he could not get out of his mind the beautiful secretary with whom he now had to work side by side. What an old fool, Mike scolded himself. God forbid you should fall in love in your old age. What are you going to do with all these feelings? The man shook his head and reproached himself for his heartlessness. At the same time, Vivi, with a satisfied smile on her face, was leaving the building and getting into a cab at the cab driver's call. The woman leaned against the car window and thought happily to herself, You got it? You got me hooked? My good man. Now I'll get it all out of you. It's a sin to miss such a big fish. It's time for me to get my rightful piece of happiness with a millionaire. I'm just going to finish this one thing first and then I'll get right on you, Mike. Turn it up, she asked the driver and he turned the radio knob. The salon was filled with some pop tune in which the singer was happily bragging to the listeners about her wealth and happiness, which consisted in private planes, diamonds, and rich idiots. In fact, Vivi was not too fond of music, but this song reflected her gambling moods right now. A couple weeks afterward, Mike's life was abruptly divided into before and after. The businessman dropped his daughter off at practice as usual and went to the office himself. Darla, being a recent graduate, decided to finally connect her life with rhythmic gymnastics. That's why she wanted to first perform at regional competitions and then start preparing to enter the Institute of Physical Education. Nothing that day did not foreshadow the terrible disaster, which in the very near future was to break into Mike's life. Like an eerie storm, he was working in his office as usual when suddenly his cell phone rang, screen up to his face. The man was surprised to see that it was his daughter calling. Strange, the businessman thought to himself, Darla never calls during practice, and that something was up. Feeling a slight uneasiness in his soul, Mike answered the phone. Hello, he said cautiously. Hello? Hello, Mike? An unfamiliar female voice asked him. Yes, the man replied in a shaky voice. And why are you calling from my daughter's cell phone? Who are you? There was a second pause on the other end of the line, and then the same voice spoke. My name is Tina. I'm your daughter Darla's coach. Your little girl just fainted right during practice. 
I don't know what happened to her, but an, an ambulance has taken her away right now. You better come to the hospital. I dictated the address. Mike felt the ground go out from under his feet, everything going dramatically dark in his eyes, barely able to keep from passing out himself. He wrote down the address of the hospital, and after drinking a large glass of water with a sedative tablet, he drove me. When he explained at the emergency room who he was and who he had come to see, he was immediately taken to the doctor who had been dealing with Darla's condition since being admitted to them. As he looked at the doctor, the businessman noted with annoyance that the expression on his face was very worried. Explain to me what's wrong with my Darla. Mike asked him as they entered his office. The doctor hesitated, a little unsure how to begin. Then he asked with a sigh, Tell me, have you ever noticed any suspicious symptoms in your daughter? Sudden bruises, weakness, elevated body temperature for no particular reason. The businessman shook his head confusedly. No, never. I have a daughter who's an athlete. Of course, she often gets bruises. But none of the things you just mentioned anyway, Darla has never complained about anything. You see, I work a lot, though I try to be home more often, but it's not always possible. The doctor twirled the pen in his hands thoughtfully before answering. I see, in that case, I have some bad news for you. Mike tensed all tense, unable to even contemplate what the doctor was going to tell him. For God, what's wrong with my daughter? He asked quietly. It's suspected that Daria has acute leukemia. An examination has shown that she has monstrously excessive levels of certain enzymes responsible for blood clotting. Unfortunately, such a disease can appear in a person at almost any age. And teenagers who are actively engaged in physical activity are, alas, also at risk. Blake lowered his eyes, unable to look at the doctor. It had not yet fully dawned on him that his daughter was in mortal danger. Glancing down at his lap, the businessman was surprised to note how his hands were shaking with a fine tremor. It seemed to the man that he was in some terrible nightmare dream from which there was only one single way out to wake up. Tell me, is there anything I can do to help her? The businessman asked the doctor in a drooping voice. His own voice seemed as if it were a stranger to him, as if he saw and heard himself from the outside, as if in a movie. The doctor looked at him carefully and answered with a sigh. Yes, but we don't have much time. We'll still do further examination. So for now, the girl will remain under our care. You can have your blood tested. If you get a complete match, then we can perform a bone marrow transplant from you or to your daughter. It's the only way to completely beat the disease. A tiny light of hope flashed in the businessman's eyes at the doctor's words. Of course, doctor, I'm willing to do anything, even give up my whole self for parts, just to make my little girl well. Good, he nodded. Come along then. You need to be prepped. Mike stopped the doctor here, touching his arm lightly. Excuse me, but can I see Darla? I need to talk to my daughter, explain things to her. I mean, she must be in such a state of terror right now. The doctor's voice sounded soft as he replied, don't worry, she already knows everything. Your girl is a real fighter, she took the news so calmly. The doctor looked at the businessman with slight envy. You know, if I had a daughter like that, I would be incredibly proud of her. Such resilience and will to Mike nodded absent-mindedly. Yes, I have her like that. You're not the first person to say those words to me. A few hours later, when all the necessary tests had been run, the doctor left the office looking glumly at the results. From the look on his face, the businessman realized that the doctor was very unhappy about something. Doctor, how can I be a donor for Darla? The doctor slowly tore his gaze away from the papers. His eyes were full of regret and sadness. To my great regret, Mike, you are not a match. Blame the world at that moment instantly lost all of its colors in the businessman's eyes. Mike felt his hands sharply pricked and therefore slowly sat down on the edge of the chair standing in the hall. Why? He could only ask. It happens often, the doctor answered as calmly as possible. Don't get upset before the time. You just need a closer relative with similar genetic material. Tell me, does your daughter have any siblings? Maybe the girl's mother could try donating her blood too. The depressed millionaire could hardly answer. Her mother died years ago in childbirth. I am the only one she has left. Darla has no brothers or sisters. The doctor pressed his lips together and took a seat next to the businessman. Then you have only one option left to urgently find a donor. I will, of course, send a request through my channels, but the chance of finding one so quickly is slim. Try to find any other relatives of Darla's, preferably on her mother's side. Even the most distant relative might happen to have a phenotype that matches ours. Mike listened to the doctor while his head was a complete fog. Finally, turning to the doctor, 
He looked at him with eyes full of mute pleading. Can I still see, Darla? Please. Sure. Let's go. The doctor responded instantly and led the man to the private room where his daughter had been transferred at Mike's request after her initial examination and all the necessary care. Daddy, Darla exclaimed, and her father rushed to her, clutching his daughter tightly in his arms. Darla, honey, how are you? He asked the businessman. Tears were already glistening in his eyes. Darla looked very pale, but she was still holding up well. When she spoke, her voice sounded almost cheerful, normal, considering what happened to me. Dad, how is this possible? Why did this disease... There was no fear in Darla's eyes, yet a huge question shone in them, and also a sense of injustice. What about my competitions, my training? The girl tried to talk about the most everyday things, obviously trying to push away the worst thoughts that way. Mike smiled at his daughter through her tears and stroked her face as gently as if she were made of crystal. I'm afraid we'll have to say goodbye to that for a while, he said slowly. The most important thing now is your health. After a moment's silence, the businessman decided to be honest with his daughter. Darla, unfortunately, I won't be able to be your donor. My blood is not suitable for you, but I will definitely solve this issue. I'll find a donor, I promise you. Upon learning that her last hope had dissipated like smoke, Darla couldn't hold back her own tears. How many dads? What? How many dads? He didn't understand. How much do the doctors give me? The man sighed heavily. And because of that sigh, the girl realized that she didn't have long to live. I see, Darla slowly muttered. It turns out that this may be our last meeting. The girl looked at this so piercingly that the businessman's heart clenched. No, of course not. Mike tried to reassure her. I'll be sure to come to you again. I'll just try to find someone whose blood is exactly right for you first. I'll save you, daughter. I swear. Darla slowly stroked her father's cheek, saying, Promise me you won't give up, even if I'm not in your life. You absolutely must live and remember me. Then I will be at peace up there. The girl raised her eyes to the ceiling, referring to the sky where her mother, grandfather, and grandmother resided. Don't tell me such things, exclaimed Mike in despair. You will live. Do you hear me? You're going to live. Mike began to cover Darla's hand with kisses, then assured her that he would come visit her in a few days. His daughter gave her father a final kiss on the cheek after which the businessman handed her over to the doctors and left the hospital as if he had just been run over by a train, a month. Only a month was left for his daughter because the disease came upon her with terrible force. The doctor said the leukemia outbreak could have been triggered by extreme stress on the eve of the competition. For the first time in his life, Mike regretted giving his daughter to rhythmic gymnastics. From helplessness, the man sank down on the cold stone steps that led to the medical center and in despair, wrapped his arms around his head. What should he do now? Where to get that damn donor when Alana's entire family had been dead for a long time, and he had never even heard of another relative. At that moment, he saw a woman stop in front of him. Or rather, he didn't even see all of her, just her feet shod in summer open sandals. A long skirt of light material was building around her legs, and Mike slowly raised his worry-weary face to her. Who are you? He asked, looking up at the street fortune teller, smiling at him as she strolled leisurely through the city streets at this hour. I, Hannah, the fortune teller, replied solemnly and held out her hand to him. I see you need help, dear. Let me give you a fortune telling on your hand. Don't be afraid, I won't take any money from you. I see when people are genuinely worried about their troubles and when they are asking for a fortune telling for fun. The most interesting thing was that this Hannah did not look at all like some gypsy from a traveling tabor. She was a decently dressed young woman of about 25 or 27 with long blonde hair in a high ponytail and a light blue denim jacket thrown carelessly over her white, aristocratic shoulders. The blue eyes looked at Mike with such genuine sympathy and warmth that he didn't have the heart to turn her away. I don't think you can help me, the businessman replied tiredly. I don't think anyone will be able to find the answer to the question that now occupies me more than anything else in the world. The fortune teller's eyebrows rose in amazement. You don't believe in the power of my gift? Or do you think that because I don't look like a gypsy, I'm of no use to you? I have an Irish gypsy grandmother, by the way. Mike looked at the girl curiously. That's the first I've ever heard of such a thing, he said, and rose slowly to his feet. Well, Hannah, if you're so sure, then please. The man held out his hand to the fortune teller and she instantly took it, scrutinizing the tiny lines on his palm and fingers, all the while Hannah was twirling his hand back and forth. And at the same time, she kept muttering affirmatively 
as if she had already figured it all out and was only looking for the latest confirmation of her amazing discovery. It's clear. Finally, she looked at the rich man with genuine concern. Do you have someone on your bloodline sick? A very close daughter or sister? I think it's the daughter after all. You want to help her, but you don't know how fate says you need to find another. Then you can save her. Mike, who had been standing there all this time listening to the fortune tellers with undisguised amazement, suddenly frowned sharply. I mean, how is that finding another? What does it all mean? Hannah took another quick glance at his palm and nodded affirmatively. That's right. There can be no doubt. The prophecy says so. Mike pulled his palms from her hands, muttered disappointedly. What kind of nonsense is this? I mean, I almost fell for it. Jesus, Anna, realizing the businessmen didn't believe her, only shrugged. It's up to you. I told you the whole truth as it is. This is the salvation for your daughter. If you let it go to waste, you won't remember me in a bad word because I warned you. With those words, Hannah strode dutifully away toward the park, leaving the anxious and shocked rich man alone with his thoughts. Find another. What on earth could that possibly mean? Meanwhile, the businessman puzzled. Although he did not believe in the predictions of this strange blonde, but his gut felt that there was something useful in this phrase, something that would help him find a way out of his dire situation with Darla. Hannah was on her way home when she witnessed a horrifying scene. Walking across the bridge, the fortune teller saw a young girl of about 17, 18 years old climbing over the railing. The intentions were more than easy to guess. Hannah rushed to her and only by a miracle managed to grab the unfortunate girl by the shoulder pulling her down with force. Are you out of your mind? She shouted at the girl when she was already sitting on the pavement, holding on to the railing. Have you had enough of life or what? What if I am? The unfortunate girl shouted back at her and large tears came to her eyes. If I simply have nothing and nowhere else to live, what do you want me to do and collect alms? Having breathed a little, the street fortune teller knelt down on her knees beside the girl. Look, I understand you're going through something apparently something really bad. Just decided to jump off the bridge into the river. But only the most horrible and unfair thing in the world shouldn't push you to do something so stupid, you know? Life is the most important. Time is the most precious thing we have. Can't you just try to walk away from it like that? The young stranger looked at the fortune teller, and her face reflected hopelessness and anguish. Tricked, she tried to explain. So deceived that now I don't know how to go on living or what to do at all. Hannah looked at her doubtfully. What about the boyfriend? No way, the stranger said. She tried to rise to her feet, but she was still a little shaky from the shock she had suffered. My aunt. She robbed me of my apartment by fraud and changed the locks. I didn't even have time to get my things before she threw me out of there like a kitten. The girl covered her face with her hands and wept bitterly. She especially felt sorry for the young, stupid one who was ready to give up her life because of some miserable square meters. Then the fortune teller suggested to her, you know what, let's go to my place now. I'll give you hot tea and we'll eat something at the same time. And you tell me everything in detail, who and how you cheated. I may be able to help you in some way. The girl looked at her with red, tear-stained eyes and nodded gratefully. Thank you. And please forgive me, I didn't mean to scare anyone. It's just the way I am, out of desperation. Don't worry, I'm not vindictive. The fortune teller smirked and extended her hand for an introduction. My name is Hannah. What's yours? Ursley nodded, and the girl replied. What a beautiful name you have. It's something European or Greek, the fortune teller explained. It's just rare now. My grandmother chose it for me. She kept hoping I'd make fewer mistakes in my life than my mother did. The young woman explained to Leslie that the name Hannah translates from ancient Greek as pure, pure, and the fortune teller's mother was characterized by excessive love and mobility, for which she eventually paid the price. Her grandmother said she was sent to the other world by one of the ancient fans, Hannah said, in between. While they put the kettle on and put the flavored shortbread cookies in a saucer, by this time they had arrived at the fortune teller's small apartment. What a horror. Leslie flung up her hands. How on earth did you survive that? The woman only shrugged and threw her jacket on the old plush couch. I don't know. I was only five at the time. That's how my grandmother raised me. She used to take care of me all the time before that while my mother was getting her own life together. And when all this happened, she took me away from the Tabor and moved here to the city. We've lived together ever since. She taught me her skills and I was the best domestic helper for her. It's just a pity she didn't live to see my high school graduation. 
My grandmother made me such a dress that all my classmates were green with envy the whole evening. Losing a mom is the biggest tragedy in a person's life, Leslie said wistfully. Then she added, I lost mine recently too. Just four months ago, I'm sorry. The fortune teller lowered her eyes. What happened? I'm sorry if I'm prying. You promised me you'd tell me what happened to you. Remember? Leslie looked sadly at her new acquaintance. The accident. Mom was coming home from work and crossing the road at a green traffic light. At that moment, some car just oversteered. The police said it had a brake failure or something. Anyway, Mom was gone, hit by a car. Hannah looked at her sympathetically, and then she showed up. That's her sister, my aunt, the girl continued. I was just out of high school and wanted to go to the institute to study history. It all came upon me so suddenly and terribly, on my mom's death, not knowing what to do next. Leslie sighed heavily before continuing. She showed up at the funeral for the first time. She was all beautiful and caring. She helped me with the wake. But then when all the guests left and it was like she'd been replaced, cold, calculating bitch, that's what she turned out to be. Yes, you and your aunt have a strained relationship, Hannah said, startled. That's an understatement, Leslie said, angrily, wiping away tears with her fist. I mean, she only wanted her mom's apartment. That's all. She complained to me that I was the only one living in such a huge two-bedroom, and she had to go to rented apartments. Since she's a sister, she's also entitled to a part of mom's property. I tried to explain to her that there was no mention of her in the will. However, this woman was just incredibly stuck. The fortune teller listened without interrupting, giving the girl a chance to speak. In the end, Leslie continued, my aunt suggested we split the apartment so that neither of us would be offended. I was a little upset, of course, but then I felt sorry. She and my mom really haven't had a good relationship all their lives. I don't know what caused it, but it must have been something serious. It's unlikely they'd have quarreled over some nonsense. Leslie took a big sip of tea and finished her unfunny story. Anyway, I agreed to the exchange, but she brought in her lawyer, and I couldn't even read what I was signing. It's my own fault, of course. I probably should have insisted that I was given time to familiarize myself with the documents. But in fact, it turned out that there was no exchange. And I signed her, this aunt, a deed of gift for my mom's apartment. For here, the girl again could not contain her feelings and cried literally to tears. What a fool I am. The girl scolded herself. How could I believe her? Well, you didn't know that she would want to do such a mean thing to you. The fortune teller tried to comfort her. It's always the last thing you expect from the people closest to you. But Leslie only shook her head negatively. I should have sensed, should have guessed that since she was acting so strangely and persistently, she was definitely up to something wrong. But I fell for it like a stupid chicken. The girl said that when she returned from the preparatory course for the Institute, the next day, she could not get to her house. The girl pounded on the door for a long time, until the aunt opened the door and announced that the apartment now belonged to her. And hers she had just cleverly contrived. Can you imagine my feelings? She asked the fortune teller. She told me that she had changed the locks, and now there was nothing in this house that belonged to me. And when I asked her, where do I go now? Knowing what she told me, Hannah looked at the girl curiously, said I could try to get into the Institute the first time and go straight into full-time study on a budget. Then they say, I will be assigned a room in the dormitory and will have a place to live. The young fortune teller was amazed at the cynicism of this horrible woman and patted her shoulder. Okay, don't worry, so we'll think of something. Until then, you can live at my place as long as you want. Girl, you're a good one. I can see you're not lying about your aunt and your situation. Any of us could be in that situation. If you only knew what I sometimes see when I'm walking around the city and reading people's hands or cards. And Hannah shook her head meaningfully. A tiny flicker of hope appeared in Leslie's eyes at that moment. Thank you so much. She thanked the fortune teller fervently. I'll definitely get a job. You'll see. I'll help you clean. I'll help you cook if you want. In response, Hannah advised the girl not to worry and promised her that she would definitely think of a way to teach her aunt a lesson and get Leslie her rightful apartment back. For the next couple of weeks, Leslie lived in Hannah's tiny apartment and helped her around the house. While the young fortune teller earned a living for herself and her entertaining passers-by in the park at the weekend fair, as well as doing personalized card readings and making individual astrological forecasts and horoscopes, for which, as Hannah assured her, she was always paid the most money. Leslie also wasted no time and went all sorts of interviews, all the same. After all this shocking story with her aunt in the apartment, 
She could not properly prepare for the entrance exams. That's why she decided to try to find some kind of job, not to hang on Hannah's neck, and at the same time to get the experience she needed, without which she was not wanted to be hired by the less decent companies. In the meantime, Mike was trying to hold on with his life. He was constantly looking for a suitable donor for his daughter, but so far everything was to no avail. As before, the businessman visited Darla in the hospital, but each time he became more and more convinced that she had only a little time left. Despite the coordinated, competent actions of doctors, as well as the necessary drugs in such a situation, the girls still needed an urgent operation. Everyone, including Darla, understood this perfectly well and did not give up hope of finding her donor at last. Remembering the fortune teller's strange prediction, Mike could not figure out its basic essence. However, he still listened to the words of Hannah, the bloodline, and hired the best detectives in town to try to track down any of his late wife's distant relatives. You need to calm down, Mike, Vivi said affectionately, walking around him and handing the man a cup of coffee with dark bitter chocolate on a platter, the businessman's favorite treat that helped him relieve a lot of stress. I'm sure sooner or later you'll reach your goal and Darlowa will recover. At the same time, the secretary looked at her boss with such a languid gaze that he had to look away. And he, of course, still liked this gorgeous woman very much, and she didn't seem to mind trying to take their relationship to the next level. Except that Mike wasn't really interested in that right now. His first priority, as he'd always said, was his daughter. Seeing that she couldn't win the millionaire over, Vivi was only breaking her fingernails under the table, giving him the friendliest smile she could muster, and that Darla of his, the woman was tearing in metal in her thoughts. She should have gotten sick right now, when he and I were just starting to have something to stick. Couldn't wait a year for me and her daddy to get married in there. She could have switched her own. No one's stopping me. I'd get his whole fortune if I did. I'd find a way to make good use of my money. He had such devious plans. Vivi continued to work at Mike's company while trying to conquer this impregnable fortress. On a future day, when Mike was scrutinizing the terms of the upcoming deal, his phone suddenly burst with a melodious sound. When the man picked up, it turned out to be one of the detectives he'd sent to track down Alana's relatives calling him. So, any news? The businessman asked hopefully. Yes and no. The detective answered him evasively. You see, the thing is, it turns out Alana doesn't have any relatives of any kind anymore. Mike's heart immediately dropped somewhere down into the darkest abyss. Are you sure? Maybe you didn't look hard enough. After all, her family was considered quite famous in its day. No second cousin, siblings, or brothers, and a deep sigh was heard at the other end of the phone. Believe me, Mike, we've poured over every archive in the town and village where your spouse was born, and there's absolutely nothing. However, as I said, we did manage to find something interesting. The businessman immediately concentrated to the best of his ability on the detective's voice. And what was that? When we checked the archives of the hospital where your wife gave birth, we found one interesting detail. The detective began cautiously. Tell me, Mike, were you aware that Alana had given birth to twins? What? The businessman couldn't believe his ears. Do you think you're saying that? Sam, what twins? My wife never cheated on me and was only pregnant with Darla. It slowly began to dawn on the rich man, and his hunch was confirmed by the detective himself. That's why I'm asking, because it's about the same single birth, he said slowly. One of the two sample reports I found says that your wife gave birth to two twin girls. Mike rubbed his own forehead tensely in his office. He resolutely did not understand what was happening now. But the doctor didn't tell us anything like that, did he? I don't see how that's possible. Did you have an ultrasound? The detective asked, yes, but can you imagine what it was like back then? The only device in the whole city, and it was malfunctioning every once in a while. Unless there was some mistake and the doctor who performed the ultrasound just didn't see the second child. But that still doesn't change the fact that I never knew anything about the second daughter. Where is she then? The detective was silent for a moment, obviously contemplating how best to say the next piece of news. That's where we come to the most interesting part. There was another woman in labor at the same time as your wife that day, the daughter of the same midwife who delivered Alana's baby. And according to the documents, the midwife's granddaughter died then, suffocated, and tangled in the umbilical cord. Jesus, Mike couldn't take it anymore. But what does this have to do with me? Most directly, I'm afraid. Mike, continued the detective. As I was saying, the main oddity was that there were originally two of each conclusion. That is, both your wife's and the midwife's daughters. 
And while in Alana's case, and it says she had one of her twins die at birth following the mother, the midwife's daughter's file is quite the opposite. Actually, they were my little girl, Mike finally realized. I'm afraid so, Sam replied sadly. We found both reports in the party section of the head doctor's drawer. Don't ask how we did it. We won't tell you anyway. Fact is, the midwife's daughter never found out anything. She thought she'd given birth to her baby. Soon after, they all moved together, the woman, the daughter, and their grandmother to live somewhere up north. And that's where their traces are finally lost. So you don't know where my daughter is now? Mike asked him quietly. Unfortunately, that's all we've been able to find out, the detective replied. But still, you now know that there is another daughter of yours somewhere, if you're lucky enough to find her. How, how am I supposed to find her when I've been counting on you for this? Mike snapped at the detective. I don't have any more time. Darla doesn't have any more time. She's dying. It took the businessman a second to pull himself back together and apologize to the detective, thanking him for his work. Mike hung up the phone and slowly sank into his desk chair. Okay, so he had been duped in the most brazen way possible, only giving up one infant out of two. This wife's card was completely fabricated, and it seems that even the midwife herself didn't know that Alana was going to have twins. When it all happened and his wife was gone, the midwife thought it would be no big deal if she gave her daughter one of the twins so that the young woman, God forbid, wouldn't go crazy with grief upon learning of her own baby girl's death. Mike felt absolutely devastated and broken, and his last hope had died before it could take shape. Right now, the businessman knew only one thing. If he lost Darla, he would lose all incentive for further life and work. His daughter was everything to him, and he certainly didn't want to live in a world where she was gone. Three days later, Hannah brought Leslie a newspaper with free classifieds. It was grabbed on the way, in case you find something normal here. Mm. Suggested the fortune teller, seeing how desperately the girl was suffering without a job everywhere she went. During this time, everywhere she was offered to pass first some paid courses or even turned back, citing the lack of yesterday's schoolgirl any experience. Leslie got upset and wanted to try to take a loan from the bank to get at least some training with which she could be hired. When Hannah was able to convince her that all the loans and courses were nothing more than an elaborate hoax paid for by enthusiasts like Leslie herself, it's better to flip through the paper. She persuaded the girl, who had become her best friend in the meantime. Here always printed vacancies for ordinary people, and maybe something will appeal to you. The girl followed the fortune teller's advice and scrutinized the thin magazine. After an agonizing choice between a dishwasher and a cleaner, Leslie chose the latter, and rightly so. Hannah encouraged her. Of course, it's not the most prestigious profession, but the firm is very good, well known, and they promise a decent salary, so it's a good reason to try for an interview. Leslie agreed with a sigh. This was not the career she had dreamed of, but on the other hand, she had to start somewhere. 25. A 20 man arriving at the address, the girl found a large and bright office of the construction firm, inside which reigned cleanliness and beauty. However, having risen to the fifth floor to go to the director of the company, Leslie froze exactly halted, unable to utter a word. The girl turned as pale as a canvas. Her only wish at that moment was to fall through the ground, but it was too late. Vivi had seen her and was now standing, blocking Leslie's path to the principal's office with her hands at her sides. You, the secretary whispered. What are you doing here, you little shit? Leslie stared at her aunt point blank, never relinquishing her angry but proud gaze. I'm here to apply for a job. Let me through, she said, and tried to get past Vivi. But she grabbed the girl roughly by the shoulders. Are you applying for a job as a cleaner? And I'm sitting here wondering how you got here. The secretary's look at that moment was like that of a snake preparing for a fatal leap. No, my dear, not today, shoved Leslie across the hall to Vivi. There's nothing for you to do here. I don't want it to be accidentally revealed later that you're the one coming to see me, my dear. That would be a disgrace that would never be cleaned up. Vivi looked at the young girl with all the anger and hatred she could muster. Hearing strange shouting and fumbling outside the door, Mike decided to go out and see for himself what was going on. Vivi, what's going on? Whether or not the girl came in for her interview, I've already gotten calls from HR. They say they lost her. Vivi wanted to explain something to him, but saw the supervisor's face gray at the sight of her niece. Mike, what's wrong with you? The secretary asked cautiously, and the nasty smile instantly flew off her face. You're my good girl, the businessman managed to say. The girl looked at him with incomprehensible eyes. She transferred her neighbor's gaze to him and back again. Vivi turned to her niece. 
and Leslie was ready to swear she saw a hellfire of rage in her eyes. Get out of here. Vivi ordered her immediately. However, Mike extended his hand toward the girl and shook his head. No, let her stay. Please, girl. I don't know your name. Give me a few minutes. I beg of you. Leslie didn't know what to do. But there was such desperation written on the man's face that the yesterday schoolgirl agreed. Okay, Leslie said simply and followed Mike. He was in a state of complete shock. After all, in front of him stood an exact copy of his daughter. Could it be true? Was this girl really his lost daughter Darla's twin? If so, he was left with one last chance to save his child. Please, let's do a DNA test, Mike pleaded with her in his office. Listen, my daughter is about to die. The doctors have already done everything they can. If it turns out you and my girl are sisters, it could literally save a life. Leslie doubted that such a thing could really happen. But the story the businessman told her about himself and his daughter and about the results of the investigation still convinced the girl to try to trust him. After all, if it was true and Darla was her sister, then she would have another family, having given her consent for the tests to be run. Leslie and Mike immediately drove to the hospital. When the girl's blood was drawn to run all the necessary tests, the man took her to his daughter's room. Darla, of course, was shocked no less than her father. However, she took Leslie's appearance very positively. She greeted the girl in a friendly manner and then told her, there is no such coincidence in nature. You can see that you and I are alike as two drops of water. You must be my lost sister. Daddy told me everything. Leslie felt like she was in some kind of fantasy movie. There was no doubt in the girl's mind that she and Darla were alike, but she never felt like she had a sister or even a twin. And after all, twins are supposed to be able to sense such things even from a distance. Congratulations. The test confirmed your parentage 100. The doctor announced to Mike and the girls with a happy smile. If Leslie is ready, we can begin the process of preparing for surgery. It was also sudden and rapid for the young girl. Of course, let's get started. It was all she could manage to nod. The preparations went well, and soon Darla was transplanted with some bone marrow and transfused with her own sister's blood. After that, the girl recovered almost immediately, and Leslie, who was lying in the ward with her, still couldn't believe that she had found both a sister and a father at the same time, in the hustle and bustle of events. Leslie did not immediately remember that she wanted to talk to Mike. That evening, when she was feeling better, she asked to spend a few minutes with her father and warned him about Vivi. Don't believe that woman, please. She said in a voice weak from the surgery. She is far from being as nice and kind as she wants to appear. In general terms, the girl told her newfound father about the story of her apartment and the fact that she was now staying with Hannah the fortune teller. Hearing about the latter, Mike immediately remembered her find another prophecy. God, that's what that meant. She was talking about Darla's sister. He hadn't realized it right away. Upon learning of his secretary's deception, the businessman was furious at her behavior. The very next day, he fired the bastard and threatened her with jail if she didn't sign the apartment back over to Leslie. Vivi wanted to be rich and wanted to stay free even more. So she gave the apartment back to her niece and left town for good. Finally recovered, Leslie was happy to know that she could now return home. She was going to go to college, just like she wanted to, and promised her father to visit her and Darla whenever she could. The girls had no doubts that they would become friends, so businessman Mike was very happy for them. Hannah Mike invited to his workplace. In gratitude for the fact that she helped his lost daughter, he made the woman his personal astrologer. And the young woman was very happy that her prophecy, having come true, saved the life of an entire family. Gradually, the first timid feelings between her and Hannah were born. Their relationship from a working relationship smoothly turned into a romantic one the man, having got to know Hannah better, realized that she could be a new breath of life for him and create for him that missing home comfort, which he so dreamed of. Soon, he and Hannah were married. The wedding was very beautiful and left the guests with many fond memories. Now they all live together in the millionaire's house and enjoy every day, which gives them the opportunity to enjoy life again and get to know each other from new sides.